Hi guys, Harbs and Arbs here. Welcome to part 2 of the history of the Planescape setting in Dungeons and Dragons. In the last video we focused on what inspired the strangeness of Planescape and looked at a bit of its initial history. In this video we'll be taking a look at some of the finer details of strangeness linked to the setting, and the series will be wrapped up in a future part 3. At the end of part 1 I touched briefly on the factions created by David Zeb Cook in the Planescape setting, but I'd like to delve into them here as they are an integral part to the setting. In an interview on theweem.com in 2010, Cook was asked where do the faction themes come from, and Cook responded with the following. My official explanation when people have asked me in the past where I got the factions from goes something like this. They're all the bad philosophy ideas that we used to argue about in college after a few too many beers. The kind of debate where you know just enough about the philosophy to get yourself in trouble, but by damn you're going to defend it just for the sake of arguing. According to the player's guide to the planes in the Planescape setting, the following is necessary for each faction. Number 1. The official faction title. Number 2. The faction philosophy. Number 3. The primary plane of influence. Number 4. Allies and enemies. Number 5. Eligibility. Number 6. Gaming benefits. And finally, number 7. Gaming restrictions. These last two were necessary to make D&D playable in the Planescape setting. Everything needs to be balanced, even if, as we saw at the end of part 1, David Cook couldn't always achieve what he wanted with the setting due to the fact that it was ultimately a setting for a tabletop role-playing game, not just a fantasy setting in its own right. We can see many links between strange factions in Planescape and real-world philosophies, such as the Fraternity of Order, whose philosophy in the campaign setting is described as follows. These folks are sure that everything's got laws. Mankind's got laws, Sigil's got laws, even the lower planes got their laws. Now, once a body's got the laws down, he does pretty well, right? He knows how to use them to his advantage and how to break them without getting caught. They can be compared to sophists from ancient Greece, and in a modern day context one could argue that some lawyers practice the sophist philosophy, manipulating laws to fit their own will. Another faction called the Fated can be linked to social Darwinists, and are described in the campaign setting as follows. This faction says the multiverse belongs to those who can hold it. Each sod makes his own fate, and there's no one else to blame for it. Those who whine about their luck are just weaklings. If they were meant to succeed, they could have. Here's the way the multiverse works, according to the Takers. Everybody's got the potential to be great, but that don't mean it's going to happen. The factions are possibly why the game setting was so impactful and why the CRPG Planescape Torment was so powerful. Alongside the fantastic writing of the video game, the deep philosophies of the factions resonate with many people in a way that other fantasy elements of D&D don't. It allows dungeon masters to be creative within ideas that they've already heard of. For example, a faction called the Harmonium, which is described in the setting as follows. The Harmonium says there's only one way to have peace, their way war or peace, squabble among each other or join the Harmonium. These are the only choices. The Harmonium believes that the ultimate goal of the multiverse is universal harmony, and it's ready to spread that belief to all those other sods out on the plains. If it takes thumping heads to spread the truth, well, the Harmonium's ready to thump heads. This type of mentality is present in some parts of the world in the form of government authoritarianism and religious fundamentalists. It's their way or the highway. Even if you haven't experienced these things yourself, you've seen them on the news or you've read about them. It's why the factions make the setting so powerful, and why, in my opinion, the gods not being allowed into Sigil is an important aspect of the Planescape setting. There is a time and a place for the Forgotten Realms gods, and I love their drama, but they often feel unrelatable with regards to their cosmic concerns. The multiverse is a big place, and it don't play by the normal rules, whatever they are, but learning the dark of them is the stuff of life. A being's got to become a blood to know all the different ways magic works, out on the Great Ring. And no basher should ever be able to just lay his hands on a map of all the portals between the planes. This is taken from the introduction to the DM's guide to the planes, and we'll go over some of the unusual terms like blood and basher later on in the video. The point is that the setting certainly does not play by normal rules, but David Zeb Cook, the creator of the setting, did set out three key ones in the player's guide to the planes, and they are as follows. Number 1. The centre of the multiverse. Number 2. The unity of rings. And number 3. The rule of threes. Cook describes these as truths, and we are told to learn them well, but what exactly are they? 
Well, they seem to be more than just rules in the traditional tabletop role-playing sense, and more of a way to frame the setting. The first truth, the centre of the multiverse, is actually quite the opposite. There is no centre, even though Sigil is often believed to be so. In the player's guide, the following is said. In blunt words, the fact is there ain't any place in the whole multiverse that's more important than any other. For instance, Mistara on the Prime Material Plane is not the most powerful, influential and important in the multiverse. It's not the sole reason all other planes and powers exist. Hey, the uncounted layers of the Abyss stink of evil itself, but exactly zero of the other outer planes kowtow to them, regardless of what the fiends there claim. The second truth is the unity of rings, where everything in the multiverse is in the form of a ring. Sigil is a ring, the Outlands are many rings, the Outer Planes form a ring and even the powers think in rings, circles of logic that have no end. Finally, the third truth, the Rule of Threes, emphasises the fact that the number has power and that anything good or bad comes in three. It even states that if you see something that is only in two, then you should wonder where the third is. One of the examples it uses of things that come in three are the alignments good, bad and neutral. These truths, along with the factions, have helped to define the strangeness of Planescape and give its own uniqueness. In the DM's Guide to the Planes, the following reference is made to this. Good campaigns have a flavour and feel all their own, something that sets them apart from all the other campaigns out there. Kryn of the Dragonlance Saga has its epic struggle. The dark gloom of the Ravenloft setting is rich with brooding horror. Elminster's Forgotten Realms homeland has the vast sprawl of ancient empires, and Athas of the Dark Sun world reeks of gritty survival. The Planescape setting has its own style and tone, something to capture the imaginations of players as they explore this strange world. It speaks to them with a certain voice and sets the tone for the worlds. And although the factions and the truth of the setting helped to set this tone, there was another factor to the setting that helped to craft its strangeness and this was the cant, something which according to Cook was inspired by slang from Elizabethan and Dickensian eras. Two books which Cook apparently used for the inspiration for this cant was The Elizabethan Underworld and Coney Catchers and Bawdy Baskets. Cant, by the way, is basically just a word for the slang in Planescape, which I have already used a bit in this video. In Sigil and Beyond, Cook tells the reader that too much of the slang is going to sound silly, and the DM does not have to force themselves to use this language. The setting states that the cant is part of the voice of the Planescape setting, and that the cant in Planescape will make the setting come alive. I suppose this has some serious merit and is true of many films and TV programs. Having a fictional language unique to certain settings like Quenya in Lord of the Rings or um, French gives the person watching a sense that the world has been truly fleshed out and is vastly unique to their own. Of course, it is not a necessity to have an entire language created for your setting, especially not in D&D, which ultimately is supposed to be about having fun, but the cant will allow the DM to give the people in Sigil and other planes the chance to sound unique to what the players are used to. Examples of two words that you might hear quite often in the setting are Burke and Blood. A Burke is defined as someone who is a fool, especially one who got himself into the mess when he should have known better whereas a blood is anyone who's an expert, sage or a professional at his work. A champion gladiator can be a blood, just like a practiced sorcerer. Calling someone a blood is a mark of high respect. So, the Planescape setting is strange, different and leaves people craving to explore it. It's rich in lore and DMs could easily create their own adventures, but what official adventures were available? Well, there were 12 official adventures altogether, but we will be taking a little look at the first one called The Eternal Boundary, which seems fitting given that it is an adventure intended for levels 1 to 3, which fits for the Planescape setting as one of Cook's goals was to have the planes more accessible to lower leveled parties. The Eternal Boundary Boundary was written by Richard Baker, who could now be defined as quite a veteran game designer. He was responsible for the creation of the Birthright campaign setting alongside Colin McComb, as well as adventures set in Dark Sun and supplements related to the Forgotten Realms. So let's first take a look at the introduction to the Eternal Boundary. To properly run the Eternal Boundary in the spirit it's intended, a dungeon master should be familiar with the Planescape campaign setting, specifically with Sigil, the Factions and the Elemental Plane of Fire. Although this adventure can be run by a DM who's not familiar with the Planescape setting, it would lose a lot of its flavour and planar ambience. 
I suppose what sticks out to me is that many of the Planescape adventures have similar openings. The Well of Worlds 1994, Dead Gods 1997 and Faction War 1998 all recommend that Planescape is absolutely necessary for the setting. Part of the magic of Planescape was the personality that came with the adventures. The Planescape setting was necessary for the strangeness of the adventure. Some adventures, especially dungeon-based ones, can flick between Oerth, Kryn and Toril, the worlds of Greyhawk, Dragonlance and the Forgotten Realms, but the adventures of Planescape required the specific strangeness of the Planescape setting. So the adventure Eternal Boundary pits the players against a sorcerer known as Green Marvent, who is described as an ambitious cutter. A cutter is a term that refers to anybody, male or female, that a person wants. It does suggest a certain amount of resourcefulness or daring, and so it's a lot better than somebody being called a Burke. Anyway, Marvant is attempting to gain control of many of the factions by planting agents within them. To do this, he has been having a wizard called the Shadow Knave cast Feign Death on individuals in the Hive, whereby one of his agents in a faction called the Dustmen, Tarana the Grey, sends the bodies from the mortuary to the elemental plane of fire. However, instead of being incinerated there, Marvin's men in the Citadel of Fire restore and reprogram them, sending them back to Sigil to seek out a faction to join. The adventure follows the player characters trying to undo this sinister plot. The adventure was well received with Dragon Magazine number 211, saying the following in December 1994. Despite the reliance on familiar settings, a tavern, a mausoleum, a trap-filled citadel, the bizarre cast of characters and almost casual way that travellers flip between planes gives Eternal Boundary a feel all its own. You're unlikely to confuse it with a conventional fantasy adventure. Of course, Cook didn't write this adventure, so what did he have to say regarding the material that followed the settings release? Most of it I liked, although I sometimes think things went too much the goth gloom route for my taste. Of course, I really liked the unplayable surreal ideas, which is maybe not so good for a game. The Factals Manifesto sticks in my mind as being a 50-50 product. Parts of it were dead on, other parts I found very disappointing. In general, I think Colin and Monte did the best jobs with the line. Cook expands on this point regarding Factals Manifesto by then saying the following. As for Factals Manifesto, some of the sections I think are great expansions on the faction background, but there are a few, particularly the Mercy Killers, unless my memory is toast, that seem to wildly miss the point, even to the extent of making the faction unplayable. But what is Factals Manifesto? The book's introduction gives us a brief summary of that. This volume, on the other hand, represents an objective expose of all the factions at once, laying each one bare to the eyes of any Burke who's brave enough to look. Of course, that's not what my researchers told their subjects, which is why this book is banned. It took an entire cast of able contributors, many of them anarchist spies, posing as other faction members, to compile the information herein. I personally like the book from a lore perspective and I think it is better than a 50-50 product, but then there is a long history of creators disapproving of their original work being taken and either changed dramatically or just continued in points where the original creator thought it should have ended. I suppose part of the problem, and at the same time genius of Cook's writing, is that he wanted the setting to be stranger. He created a setting that, if it wasn't bound by the rules of a tabletop role-playing game, could have been something more. However, Planescape had to stay within certain boundaries that some authors don't have. Planescape is strange, lore-rich, and fascinating. So why was it discontinued at the start of 3rd edition, and will we see it again in the future? Well, that's for part 3. If you enjoyed this video, then do please give me a like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Bye!